الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده سبحانه وتعالى حمد الشاكرين حمد المعترفين بأنعمه العظيمة وآلائه الجسيمة اللهم لك الحمد يا ربنا أنت قيوم السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد أنت خالق السماوات والأرض ومن فيهن ولك الحمد يا ربنا أنت الحق ووعدك حق ولقاؤك حق والجنة حق والنار حق ولك الحمد فمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم حق اللهم لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك وعظيم سلطانك جل وجهك وعز وعز جاهك تفعل ما تشاء بقدرتك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين اللهم صلي وسلم وزد وبارك على الحبيب المصطفى محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأتباعه ومن اهتدى بهديه وعمل بسنته إلى يوم الدين ورضى اللهم عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator of heavens and earth the provider, the sustainer the cherisher, the source of every bounty the grantor of every good I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for bringing us to the fold of Islam for giving us the strength, the inspiration and the insight to walk in the footsteps of the beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah to extend his blessings to our families and our loved ones. I ask Allah to give us the strength to be steadfast on the path of Islam. Allahumma ameen. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's final prophet and messenger the bearer of glad tidings, the carrier of the torch of light, the most beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I ask Allah to extend his blessings to the Prophet, his family, his descendants, his companions and their followers, and all men and women that walk in their footsteps. And I ask Allah to make each and every one of us among them. Allahumma ameen. My dear brothers and sisters, I greet you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Last Friday, we said that as the summer begins, we wanted to focus on this beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that expands upon the idea of taking advantage of the limited time that we have in our hands. And this is the hadith that was narrated in most of the major books by Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu when he was very young, as the Prophet's cousin, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, اغتنم خمسا قبل خمس Take advantage of five before five. اغتنم خمسا قبل خمس شبابك قبل هرمك وصحتك قبل سقمك وغناك قبل فقرك وفراغك قبل شغلك وحياتك قبل موتك. What are the five things that we need to take advantage of before five other things come? The Prophet says, صلى الله عليه وسلم, take advantage of your youth before your old age. Take advantage of your health before your sickness. Take advantage of your wealth before your poverty or deprivation. Take advantage of your free time before your preoccupation. And take advantage of your life before your death. I said last Friday that inshallah we will take one set of these fives uh, every Friday for the next five weeks inshallah to cover the summer. As the summer starts, as I mentioned earlier, many of us, particularly young people, we have plenty of time. And we wanted to remind ourselves and remind our young brothers and sisters and everyone here that time truly is uh, the greatest asset of your life. It is more important than wealth. It is more important than money. It is more important than houses and cars and education and career. Time is all you've got. Every breath you take, uh, the clock is ticking away and a piece of that 
asset is taken away from you. Essentially, the Prophet ﷺ was giving advice to you know, someone that is in the capacity of his own son. He treated Ibn Abbas. Those of you who don't know, by the way, the Prophet ﷺ raised a lot of young people in his own household that were not his kids. He raised Ali ibn Abi Talib and he was not his kid. Uh, Zubair ibn al-Awam and he was not his kid. Uh, 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 Zayd ibn Haritha and he was not his kid. He raised uh, uh, this particular cousin of his, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, and he was not his kid either. Right? This idea, by the way, this sunnah, this sunnah of adopting a child and raising this child in your own household does not exist in our Muslim world anymore. It doesn't exist in the Muslim world anymore. But the Prophet ﷺ had five or six other kids that are not his blood that he was raising in his own household. So he treated all of them like his own children. Yes, they had different last names, which is also required in Islamic law. If you decide to adopt a child, the child's identity needs to be independent of yours, right? Cannot hide the, 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 the fact, uh, you know, this very important fact from, from the child, that the child is not really your blood, son or daughter, right? Other than that, you treat them like your own kid. You raise them in your own house, right? So the Prophet ﷺ is giving advice to Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu. Much like, if you remember from last Friday, Luqman al-Hakim was giving advice to his own child. The Prophet ﷺ tells Ibn Abbas about the five things that we need to take advantage of before the five other things come. And Luqman gave advice to his own child, which I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, very briefly last Friday, to establish a mission statement about life. And what is that mission statement? It hinges upon those four components, if you remember from last Friday, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes first before anything. God comes first, right? Number two, parents. And with parents, family, and our obligations, towards our own families, right? God, family. It goes like this. Third was obligations, religious obligations, social obligations, financial obligations, educational obligations. The idea that I need to fulfill my responsibilities in this world. Number four is to do it all with a great positive attitude. It's about your behavior. It's about how you treat others. It's about how everybody else fits in your own circle, right? But today, inshallah ta'ala, we wanted to talk about the first component of this hadith, which is اغتنم شبابك قبل هرمك Take advantage of your youthful years before your old age. But before I jump into that, I wanted to comment on the word اغتنم, which is the very first word in the hadith itself. اغتنم, what does it mean? Take advantage of a benefit. From the word غنيمه in Arabic. It's a very specific word. It's a very specific word with a very specific usage. And I wanted to comment on this in the next couple of minutes or so. It has two different senses in the Arabic language. The word irtanim or the word ghanima, benefit. Number one, it is something that is acquired through effort and hustling. In fact, the, the Arabic word for the spoils of war is what? Ghanaim. The plural of ghanima. It's not something that is laying around for the taking. It's something that you have to fight the enemy and you have to strategize and you have to defeat the enemy and after that you are entitled to pick up the spoils of war, right? It's not something that is readily available. This particular benefit, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, اغتنم, take advantage, meaning put the effort to take that benefit. It is not available for everyone. You have to put the effort, right? It is not a low-hanging fruit from the tree. Is something that you got to hustle for. The second sense of the word ghanima or ightanim in Arabic is that there is a limited window of opportunity. It's not available forever. You don't have all the time in the world. It's something that you got to hustle for, but you got to do that within a limited amount of time. That's why in, in, in modern day marketing, for example, in the Arab world, they use this word a lot with clearance sales. اغتنم الفرصة. Take advantage of the opportunity. Clearance sale expires tonight. Buy it now. Get one, uh, buy one, get one free. They use the word اغتنم a lot when it comes to this. So again, what are the two senses of the word? The two senses is you have to put the effort. And number two, you have a limited time to do that. 
which makes me give you a metaphor, you know, especially all the young people here. The metaphor of the hadith, in my opinion, the Prophet is saying to Abdullah ibn Abbas, take advantage of five before five. The metaphor that I want to use is that of, you know, Black Friday clearance sales, which is not something that I personally engage in, by the way. I, I really dislike it. I think it, it is, it's synonymous to the consumerism culture of this country that I absolutely abhor, okay? But a lot of people do it because they want to buy something that is at a discounted rate, okay? So what do they do on Black Friday? They go and set up camp like the night before, right? And, and they get dressed properly. It's November, so it's very cold. You know, they wear their jackets and they bring their blankets and everything, right? They are gearing up for battle. They're getting ready for war, right? And they camp out, you know, at Best Buy or Walmart or God knows what, overnight. And then in the morning, 6 a.m. or whatever, they open the doors. What, what do people do? You have the invasion of the zombies, right? They, they walk into the stores in order to grab whatever they can. I actually see both senses of the word ghanima in there, right? There is a war going on. There's a battle. There's effort. You cannot get the, the, the Black Friday clearance sales when you're sitting at home. It's not something that you order on Amazon. You got to go there, go through the physical pain, you know, personally in order to get it. Number two, it is bound by that day. It is limited by the business hours of that day. The day after, the prices will change. And of course, you know, Americans are very good. So they came up with other concepts. You know, there is like, you know, Cyber Monday, right? You know, with another clearance sale coming up, right? So in order to get you to buy more stuff. But the idea is that when you treat this hadith, when you think of your life in general, think of your life as a benefit that I need to gain. And this benefit is going to require effort, a lot of effort. It's not going to be easy. Number two, it has a very limited window of opportunity. And I need to operate within that window, after which it's over. Your opportunity basically expires. And this applies so much to the first component of the hadith. I mean, when, it, when, the, when the hadith says, take advantage of your wealth before you, God forbid, become poor, Okay, I mean, you can be 16 years of age and have money. You can be 50 years of age and have, you can be 85 years of age and you're still very wealthy. So you can take advantage of this part of the hadith anytime throughout your life. But when it comes to shabab, when it comes to youthfulness, there's a very limited window of opportunity. This is not something that can be replicated later on in your life, okay? Now, there's a couple of things that I wanted to mention here about that first part of the hadith in particular. Shababaka qabla hiramik. Take advantage of your youth before your old age. Number one, what do we mean by youth? Because a lot of older people might be upset. You know, oh, come on, this hadith doesn't apply to me. Right? What do we mean by youth? In, in uh, you know, in regular American culture, the word youth is usually synonymous to teenagers. Okay, maybe preteens would be included as well. So you're talking 10, 11, 12, all the way through 17 or 18. If you're 25, you're not necessarily considered youth in this country. Okay, when we say programs for the youth and all the youth are invited, a lot of people usually think teenagers. Okay, in, in Muslim countries, the word youth is usually extended to people in their 20s, you know, all the way up to 30, perhaps. But I want to give you some good news because the Quran has a different definition for youth. Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in one of the ayat of the Quran, Hatta idha balaga ashuddahu wa balaga arba'ina sana. When he or she reached the strongest point of their life and reached the age of 40. In other, and that actually made a lot of Muslim scholars to consider youthful age all the way up to the age of 40. If you are over 40, perhaps you're not youth anymore, but I will still show you how the hadith applies to you. But again, if you are 40 or younger, you need to pay very, very close attention to what I'll say today. Now, if you are older than 40, then you have a son or a daughter that are in this age. You have a sibling that is in this age. You have someone in your family that you care about that is in this age. There is someone in your life 
that is important to you that is in, in, in this age, which means that you still have to be paying attention, inshallah. You're not going to say, oh, Imam, inshallah, I'll see you next week when you talk about uh, you know, benefits that are suitable for my age. Okay? You know, youth uh, is, is something that we all care about, either because we are young ourselves or because we have somebody in our lives that is young. Okay? So that's number one. I wanted to define what that means first. Number two. A lot of the Sahaba used to come to the Prophet ﷺ and complain about something very strange. So one of the Sahaba uh, you know, came to him and he said, Ya Rasulullah, ذهب أهل الدثور بالأجور. Messenger of Allah, the wealthy, got away with all the rewards. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him why. He said, because I am poor, I am not able to give sadaqah. But the wealthy, they have a lot of money, so they're able to give sadaqah. This whole act of worship that is called sadaqah is something that I cannot do. I will live and die having never give any sadaqah. And as I always say as a Muslim, it is either you are a recipient of zakah or a giver. There is nothing in between. If you are not giving sadaqah, that I need to ask you, is it because you deserve zakah? In which case, please fill the financial assistance form and we will help you. No, 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 alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Then you need to be giving sadaqah. It's either or. There's, there's no gray area in between. It's either you give or someone else gives you, right? Now, if I asked you right now, which would you rather be? Someone that receives sadaqah or someone that gives sadaqah? I think every single one would say, I would rather give. And I would rather that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me so that I have enough for myself and enough to give as well, right? That is the proper mentality. But there's a lot of people that are, that are in the middle, right? Like they, 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 they don't deserve zakah, but they don't give sadaqah either. And I tell them, you need, you need to make a choice. It's either you're a recipient or you are a giver, right? But casting that aside, the man comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, I am a recipient of sadaqah. I will live like this my entire life because I am poor. Ahl al-Duthur, the wealthy, they get away with all these rewards. Some women would come to the Prophet ﷺ and say to him, Ya Rasulullah, we are busy with our children, we are busy taking care of our households, we cannot perform jihad like our husbands do. They get away with all the, the ajr, all the rewards of, of going to war with you and defending Islam with you, and here we are, you know, just sitting here. Doing that. A lot of disabled people used to come to the Prophet and tell him, Ya Rasulullah, we cannot be with you because you know we're blind. Remember the story of Abdullah ibn Umar Maktoum? He comes to the Prophet and Ya Rasulullah, I want to come and fight in battle with you. And he says, Ya Abdullah, you know, you're, you're blind. I, I need you behind. I need you to stay in Medina. Ya Rasulullah, that means I will miss out on jihad my entire life because I am disabled. And the Prophet ﷺ would appoint him interim governor of Medina while the Muslim army is fighting in battle just to restore his honor. Again, true believers are haunted by the idea that there are acts of worship that they don't have access to. That there are acts of worship that somebody else can do and they cannot do. When I was, when I was younger, I used to tell my dad, you know, in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ talks a lot about al-hakim al-adil, the just ruler. And the benefits of the just ruler and the rewards on the day of judgment for just rulers. And I used to tell my dad, well, I, I, don't, I know I will never become a ruler in order to become just. So my dad would say, well, you can become a just ruler in anything that you can control. In your own business in your own job, with your own family, Allah will still reward you as a just ruler if you practice being a ruler in your own circle of influence. And he would cite the hadith for me, كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَتِهِ Every single one of you is a shepherd and every shepherd is responsible for their flock. So you can be a ruler, my dad used to tell me, if you consider yourself a shepherd at some point without necessarily becoming a king or a governor or a president or whatever that is, right? But what I'm saying is that true Muslims are always scared that there's an act of worship out there that they cannot practice. Because they're always looking for more ways to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What if I told you today that there's an act of worship that only young people can practice? 
There is an act of worship that only the youth have access to, and the rest of us, you know, I'm not 40 anymore, so I'm not in that category. خلاص, that's it. I'm not youth anymore. I can't claim to be youth. Many of you cannot claim to be youth anymore. But those of you who are 40 and younger, there's an act of worship that only you can practice. And only you can experience. And only you can taste the beauty of. What is that? If you remember in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّ There are seven categories of people that will enjoy the shade of the throne on the day of judgment and no one else. One of the seven is وَشَابٌ نَشَأَ فِي طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ A youth that grew up obedient to Allah. Which means if you are a young person and you choose to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against culture, against hormones, against tendencies, against exploitation, against opportunities, you choose to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have a chance to enjoy the shade of the throne on the day of judgment when no one else can. Imam, what are you saying? What if I repented and became a good Muslim at the age of 25 or the age of 45 or the age of 55? I say, no, no, that's fine. Allah will accept your repentance and you will be a good Muslim and you will go to Jannah. But you will not enjoy the shade of the throne like this youth did. Window of opportunity, remember? It's a window of opportunity. As a young person, you put the effort to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a young age and you learn the art of being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a young age and you resist the temptation to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal, then on the day of judgment you will enjoy the shade of the throne when everyone else has to suffer. Good and bad, by the way, will suffer. The righteous and the kuffar will suffer on the day of judgment. Except those seven that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specified in the hadith, one of them is shabbun nasha'a fi ta'atillah, a young person that grew up obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it such a big deal for like a 16, 17 year old to be obedient to Allah? Especially in this society. Because Western culture gives leeway to young people. Enables young people to do whatever they want. Let them live their years. They're going to be fine later. Kids will be kids. Teenagers will be teenagers. It's all right. Look at all the pressure that they experience at school. Everyone else is doing it. Let them get it out of their system. We are constantly making excuses for young people in this society. So young people are like, you know, why not take advantage of it to the fullest? I mean, so and so did it, so and so did it, so and so did it, and why not me? And one day, inshallah, I will repent, I'll become a good person, I'll get back on track, right? Well, some people do, and some people don't. Because you don't know, once you go down the slippery slope, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know if you'll have the, the strength and the resilience to turn your life around and, and return to the path. You don't know that. And so in the midst of these circumstances, with all the temptations and all the pressure, I mean, oh my God, I look at my, you know, my own kids or I look at teenagers in this community and what they have to experience at school, for example, compared to what I have to experience, I was in Jannah. My high school was like Jannah, I swear to God. Even though we had violence, we had gang activities, we had profanity, but it is nothing like what high schoolers have to experience in this day and age. And that is why when one of them chooses to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala under these circumstances, you deserve none, nothing but the shade of the throne. Keep that in mind. All of you young people that are younger than 40 here, nasha'a fi ta'atillah, you grew up in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are granted this opportunity that only young people have. If you are 55, خلاص, you have to find something else to get you closer to Allah Azza wa This is not on the table for you anymore, right? Number three, this is my third point about, uh, you know, shababaka qabla hiramik. Your youth before your old age. I examine the community a lot. And I noticed this, that some brothers and sisters in the community are just so busy. They're so busy. They're very sincere, but they're so busy. They, they spend so much time at work, and whatever time left, they spend it with their families. We ask them to come attend events. I'm so sorry, Imam. Wallah, I want to come, but I'm so busy. 
come volunteer at the masjid, I'm so busy. Come to Salat al-Taraweeh, I'm so busy. Come to Tahajjid in Ramadan, I swear, I am busy, I wish I could. Come help with this, come attend that, I'm so busy. Busy, 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 busy. It's the most commonly used word in the Muslim community. It's become a lame excuse that I really resent. But you know what? I'm not going to judge them either because some of these brothers and sisters, I know they're sincere when they say, I'm busy. But here's the thing. On the other hand, there are some brothers and sisters in the community that would have a full-time job. They own a couple of businesses. They sit on like five or six boards. They attend every event. They come to every Jum'ah. They volunteer at the masjid. They travel abroad. They go on vacations. They spend time with their kids. They have social media presence. You call them, they call you right back. You text them, they text you right back. You're like wondering, what are these people? How do you manage to do this? How can you be so effective in, in using your time? Right? Are they smarter than the first category? Not necessarily. Are they more successful than the first category? In almost every instance, yes. I remember when I was in college, right? And I would look at Muslim students on campus. And I would compare those who are involved at their MSA and those who are not, in terms of their grades and their academic excellence, in almost every case. Those who are heavily involved in MSA had better grades than those who exclusively just focused on education and schooling. It always, always boggled my mind. Why? Because here's the thing. What happens at a young age, brothers and sisters, is that you get to acquire good habits and good skills. One of them is effective time management. At a young age, when you're still a high schooler, if you learn how to juggle your responsibilities, school, parents, community, entertainment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and learn the art of organizing your day, you will likely be more effective when you grow up, when you become older, right? It's very simple math. Some of these young brothers, you know, mashallah, in high school, I know them personally. They attend the halaqa every week. They teach at Sunday school. They have a part-time job. And they go to school full-time. And they come volunteer at the masjid. And any time we ask them, they show up and they still get straight A's. And when they go to college, they still have part-time jobs. They help at MSA on campus. They volunteer in the community. They memorize the Quran. They're still working extremely hard. Right? And that is why when these people grow up and they have their own families, they will juggle a couple of businesses. They will have full-time jobs. They will volunteer at the masjid and sit on boards and be on this committee and, and come to Jum'ah, the first person to come to Jum'ah and then be the last person to, come to, to, to leave the masjid. This is an art that only you can learn at a young age. If you grow up and you're 45 and you have, learnt, have not learned how to organize your day, you will likely be like this for the rest of your life. What do you do for your existence? Well, I work. And then what? I, I don't know. There's no time to do anything else. But you ask one of these other sisters, what do you do, sister? Oh, I have a full-time job, and, I, and I, I'm involved with this organization. I'm involved with that organization. I sit on this committee. I lead this halqa. I teach at this program. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. MashaAllah. How do you get the time to do this? Well, I learned to do it when I was in high school. Efficiency. Efficiency in utilizing your time. This is something that you can learn now as a young person. Again, what does the hadith say? Irtanim. Take advantage of. Requires hustling and requires getting it done within a limited window of opportunity. Shababaka qabla hiramik. As young brothers and sisters in this community, ask yourselves, are you prepared for the next 10 years? How this is going to affect you and your education and, and your career and your economic stability, and your financial integrity, and your ability to build a family, are you prepared for that? You cannot afford to be lost to stupidity as young people. Because the challenges are monumental, brothers and sisters. Challenges of defending ourselves, and defending our community, and defending our faith, and defending our families, and defending the values of every good 
person and every man or woman of conscience in this world. You are the Muslim community. You are the heirs of the prophets. You cannot afford to be just lost into what everyone else, the decadence that everyone else is engaged in. You are Muslim brothers and sisters. You are Muslim men and women. You live for something that is more sublime. You are the best nation brought to mankind. You cannot afford it. You cannot afford to be just like everybody else. You can't. Who will then enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong if we are like everybody else? Who is the last man standing? Who is the last guard by the post if not us? I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our good deeds and forgive us our sins and establish us and our hearts firmly. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands and speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the heart. Ud'u Allah wa antum muqinuna bil ijabah. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu bihi wa nasta'adihi wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihi allahu fahuwa al-muhtad wa man yudlil falan tajida lahu waliya murshida wa usalli wa usallimu ala al-mab'uthi rahmata lil'alameen wa qa'id al-ghurri al-mayameen muhammadin al-sadiq al-wa'ad al-ameen اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وارض عنا معهم بفضلك وكرمك أرحم الراحمين اللهم آمين My dear brothers and sisters, as the summer begins again, uh, we said uh, last week that we are going to um, cover uh, the five uh, before five that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, spoke about in the hadith. He was admonishing, giving advice to his young cousin, Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he said to him, take advantage of five before five. And we said that every Friday, inshallah, until the end of summer, we're going to cover one of these over the next five weeks. And today, we covered the first portion of the hadith, Shababaka qabla hiramik. Take advantage of your youth before your old age. And I said that there are opportunities available to young people that are simply not available to people who are older, right? I remember vividly, you know, my, my parents used to tell me when I was a kid, young people have stronger memory. You need to get your Qur'an memorized before you get busy. And I used to take it lightly. And I realized today that all the Qur'an that I memorized before the age of 18 is much stronger and more stable in my mind than the Qur'an that I memorized later. SubhanAllah. I almost don't need to review it. Anything that I memorized earlier it really stuck in my head like Qul Allah Ahad. And this is my invitation again to young brothers and sisters. If you would love to memorize as much of the Quran as possible, do it when you are still in your teens. Do it when you're young. And if you are in your mid-twenties, it is still better for you to memorize parts of the Quran at that age than being in your mid-thirties and so on and so forth. The younger, the better when it comes to memorizing the Quran. Acquire more skills, read more books, formulate your world views, be exposed, get ready for college, build careers. There is a tremendous amount of competition now. Everyone gets 4.0. Berkeley and Stanford and Harvard and Yale, they don't really care about your 4.0 anymore. They're looking for more. What are you doing today that will prepare you for college? If you are a college student, what are you doing today in order to prepare you for med school or for grad school or a great PhD program somewhere? You know, college admission committees are, are looking for a lot more. They're looking for volunteer activities. They're looking for extracurricular activities. They're looking for traveling the world. If you are involved in your faith community, they love to see that. You can start building your resume at a young age. Volunteer work. I help refugees. I help in this program. I taught the youth. I taught at Sunday school. All of that matters significantly. Sometimes it matters as much as your GPA matters. What are you doing as a young person today that will enable you to lead a more successful future? It's a very important question, again, that we ask ourselves, inspired by what the Prophet ﷺ says, اغتنم خمسا قبل خمس شبابك قبل هرمك. Take advantage of your youth before your old age. And honestly, the way I look at it is that the Prophet ﷺ dedicates a request to young people. And he says, you and you and you. Take advantage of your youth before your old age. The Prophet ﷺ speaks to you directly. And you need to say, Ya Rasulullah, سمعنا wa Messenger of Allah, we listen and obey. 
thank you for giving me advice. I was busy and distracted and thank you for helping me see things differently. Sallallahu ala Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam taslim and kathira. I wanted to end with a story. It's a story from Ottoman times. And I love Ottoman history. One of the sultans, uh, one of the kings of the Ottoman Empire, Sultan Murad II. Uh, he was known to be a man of the arts, poetry. He was well learned. He was blessed with a child and he called his child Muhammad. And as the great kings have done, he appointed a mentor, a teacher of Islam in order to take care of his son as his son is growing up and his son is being prepared to be the crown prince and to become the king after him, right? So he appointed this great sage, wise man, this great knowledgeable scholar, his name was Muhammad Shamsuddin. In, in Western scholarship, is they call him Ak Shamsuddin. I don't know why. But his name is Muhammad Shamsuddin. Muhammad Shamsuddin took care of young Muhammad at a very young age. And he taught them the deen. He taught them the Quran and the hadith and the fiqh and philosophy and the arts and, and things like that. But for some reason, he kept emphasizing a particular hadith to young Muhammad. He kept emphasizing a particular hadith to young Muhammad. This is a hadith in, in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad. It's in Mustadrak and in other books as well. In which the Prophet ﷺ says, لَتُفْتَحَنَّ الْقُسْطَنْتِينِيَّ فَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا وَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ جَيْشُهَا Constantinople will be conquered. And the most beautiful leader will be the leader of the army that will conquer Constantinople. And the most beautiful army will be that army. Shamsuddin continued to instill that idea in the heart and the mind of young Muhammad ibn Murad. A few years later, Sultan Murad decided to relinquish power. He wanted to focus on ibadah. He wants to travel up in the mountains and just live there, isolate himself from politics. He wanted to just focus on poetry, on the arts, and learning Islam. So he abdicated the throne to who? To his son Muhammad. And Muhammad suddenly became the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. And literally the Crusaders were at the gates, led by the Hungarians. So one conquest after the other, one attack after the other, and young Muhammad managed to fend off the Hungarians and he defeated the Crusades. But it, then it got way too much for him and he does not have experience militarily or politically. So he sends a messenger to his father up in the mountains and he says, Father, please come, take back the throne, lead the armies and defend Islam. I don't know if I can do this anymore. So the father said, no, I'm not doing that. So young Muhammad became very, very angry. So he brought a few guards from the special the elite units and he gave them a letter. And in that letter to his father, he said, if you are the Sultan, then come here and lead your armies, the enemies at the gate. And if I am the Sultan, I command you to come here and lead the armies because the enemy is at the gate. So Sultan Murad, he received the letter, he smiled, and he realized that his son is now mature. And he decided to acquiesce. He came all the way to, uh, to Konya, the, the capital of the Ottomans at the time, and he led the armies until he was victorious over the crusaders and he destroyed them completely. A few years later, he passed away. Muhammad ascended the throne naturally this time. And he became Muhammad II. Muhammad I is the father of Sultan Murad. The Turks would call him Mehmet, Mehmet II. And the very first task of his reign, the second time, for Sultan Muhammad was, I need to be this emir that will take Constantinople, the jewel of Western civilization. I need to be the one that the Prophet ﷺ talked about in the Hadith. How beautiful is the Amir and how beautiful is the army. I want this Amir to be me and I want the army to be mine. Three years later, Sultan Muhammad conquered the city of Constantinople, took it into the fold of Islam, 
his teacher, Shamsuddin, discovered the tomb of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, if you remember the story, and he directed the Sultan to where the tomb was, and the Sultan built a masjid around, a masjid that still stands until today. If you go to Istanbul, you always visit the masjid of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, right? And the Romans started calling Sultan Muhammad II Caesar. Why? Because now he controls the seat of the Roman Empire. He controls Constantinople. And the king that controls Constantinople is automatically considered to be Caesar. He is Caesar. He is the Khalifa. He is King Sultan Mehmed II. And brothers and sisters, he was 21 years old when he walked into the city of Constantinople. 21 years old. He was 11 when his father abdicated the throne the first time. I'm just going to let you mull this over for a second. I'm not going to make any comments. I'm just going to let all the young people think about this for a second. And what is it that you've achieved before the age of 21? Ask yourself and find your excuses. And ask yourself if those are legitimate excuses or not. I ask Allah to accept the shuhada of this ummah in the highest level of Jannah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep them in our memory and to keep us honest and true to their legacy. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this day to protect and preserve the young people in our community, uh, to protect and preserve the youth, boys and girls, men and women. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us as a community embrace them and accommodate them and create institutions that will be conducive to their health of heart and mind. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish the Muslim community as a community of strength and righteousness. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our brotherhood and sisterhood and to gather all of us in the highest level of Jannah. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma laka alhamdu kama in baghi li jalali wa jshika wa azim sultanik. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira. Taqabbal minna ya rabbana innaka anta al-sami wa al-alim. وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اهدنا واجعلنا هداة مهديين لا ضالين ولا مضلين نحب بحبك من أحبك ونعادي بعداواتك من عاداك اللهم ارحم شهداء المسلمين اللهم ارحم شهداء المسلمين اللهم اجعلنا يا ربنا من عتقائك من النار واجعلنا من المقبولين اللهم احفظ شباب المسلمين اللهم احفظ شباب المسلمين واجعلنا عونا لهم برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم وكما جمعتنا في هذا المكان على هذه الهيئه فاجمعنا في مستقر رحمتك في اعلى عليين وادخلنا الجنه في زمره النبي الكريم برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات المسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم والاموات انك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات يا رب العالمين واقم الصلاه ان الصلاه كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا